Greetings. I'm Walt Bauer, and I'd like to welcome you to the Human Development Institute's first fall seminar. My brief visual description is I am a white male wearing glasses with hazel eyes and a blue shirt with a blue and gray striped tie. My pronouns are he, him, his. I'm sitting in front of a virtual background. My virtual background is a three-story brick academic building that has offices for the Human Development Institute on the University of Kentucky campus. We welcome all the participants who are joining us today. Our moderator and panelists will provide an opportunity for questions today. We welcome questions from all of our participants. Please type your questions for our speakers in the Q&A box for a robust question and answer session. If you hover over the bottom of your Zoom screen, you will see the Q&A option. Please use the chat for technical questions. We have live captioning for the webinar in the closed captioning feature. To turn on the captioning, click on the closed caption button at the bottom of your screen and then click show subtitle. Should you have any questions about CEUs, you can contact me. My email address is walt.bauer at uky.u. Again, my email address is walt.bauer at uky.edu. Please take a moment to complete our brief evaluation. You receive you you will receive an email that provides a link to access the session evaluation after this webinar. It is really helpful as we plan for upcoming webinars. The title of the webinar is The Art of the Grant Proposal. Considerations in preparing successful applications for extramural funding. It is a pleasure and a privilege to introduce our moderator today. Dr. Phil Rumroll is a professor of counselor education and director of research in the Human Development Institute at the University of Kentucky. I'm now going to turn it over to Dr. Rumroll. Well, thank you, Dr. Bauer. That's one of the more enthusiastic uh, introductions I've heard of my uh, name in quite some time. So I <clears throat> really appreciate you leading us through this program. Good afternoon or good morning or good evening, whichever the case may be to all of you who are joining us. And I want to add my welcome to the Human Development Institute's fall seminar series. This is the first program in the fall, and it's a great honor and privilege to be here with you to discuss strategies for uh, uh, grant writing. If you go to the next slide, I am delighted to have our August panel here with us today, my friends and colleagues, Dr. Caroline Gooden, who many of you know as the Director of Training in our Human Development oh. Institute. Dr. Gooden, hello. Hi, I'm right here, Dr. Rumrell. And we're also uh, welcoming Dr. Michael Leslie, who is the Director of Evaluation and Data at HDI. Michael, good afternoon. Good afternoon, Dr. Rumrell. Thanks for having me. Glad you're here. Thank you very much. Um, uh, Walt gave a brief visual description of himself as a universal design uh, matter. I will do the same. I'm a, a middle-aged white male, uh, mostly bald with uh, mostly gray hair. What's left is gray, hazel colored eyes. I'm also wearing a blue shirt today and I'm sitting in front of a nondescript background uh, in, my, uh, in my home office. Pronouns are he, his, and him. Uh, Dr. Gooden, would you like to introduce or describe yourself uh, for the audience? I will. Thank you, Dr. Rummel. So I am Caroline Gooden, uh, Director of Training and the LEND Program here at Human Development Institute. Happy to be with you all today. I am a white female, shoulder length hair, and blue it seems to be our color. I'm also wearing a blue sweater with a blurred background here at the Mineral Industries Building on campus. Excellent. And the estimable Dr. Leslie, please. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Dr. Romo. Uh, so my name is Michael Leslie. I am the uh, Evaluation and Data Director here at the Human Development Institute. I see a few of our uh, very amazing evaluation team members here on the call. Um, so welcome. Thanks for being here. 
Uh, I am a white male. I have blue eyes and brown hair. I'm wearing a blue button-up shirt and also in front of a nondescript background in my home office. Terrific. Thank you. Thank you. And once again, uh, welcome. Uh, we'll go on to the next slide here. We do want to tell you that we had a few other folks uh, we were going to include uh, on this panel. Uh, they were unavoidably detained, so we've moved some of the content around, but I'll explain the format of how we want to uh, proceed. Shouldn't be any difference in the content of the, uh, uh, of the presentation. As Dr. Bauer mentioned, we'll, we'll welcome any uh, feedback and questions you may have as you go. Dr. Bauer, are you monitoring the chat in real time? Yeah, yes, I am, Dr. Rumroll. Okay, so uh, we'll stop periodically and just see if there's anything interesting uh, uh, in there that we should entertain as we go. And failing that, Walt, um, uh, if you don't see anything that needs to uh, be, be dealt with right away, we can wait until the end and have a Q&A session when we're finished. Is that reasonable? Excellent. Sounds good. Excellent. Okay, very good. So this is really about preparing grant proposals. And the first thing that struck us uh, in putting this program together is you first have to figure out uh, where the proposals are and what the announcements are and funding agencies in your own particular area. So if we go to the next slide, Dr. Bauer, it says where the grants are. And this has been left blank purposely because I wanted each of our panelists and I'll um, chime in as well to talk a little bit about the various uh, funding agencies um, that they have used in their own work and where the funding comes from uh, in their own uh, projects. Uh, both of our uh, uh, panelists have had extensive experience with a variety of different funded projects at uh, uh, the um, um, at the foundation, uh, state, uh, national, and, and local levels, and internal grants as well. So we've got a real diversity in terms of the types of projects that folks have been involved with. But I just thought we might just share by way of uh, overview, if you just say a few words about what your primary uh, grant related interests have been, and particularly what funding agencies you've used most often, shall we say, in your recent work. Uh, and Dr. Gooden, could, could we start with you? You can. Um, I would say a couple of the grants that I would include is from, from some small local ones to some big national ones. Um, and I'll start with the most recent. Um, we recently, in a collaborative proposal between uh, the Interdisciplinary Early Childhood Department at UK and the Communication Sciences Disorder Department, we applied for a um, teacher preparation program um, that we were just awarded October 1st of this year. And we will be training uh, early childhood teachers and speech pathologists to work with children who are born substance ex born as the result of substance exposure in utero and their families. So that's a, a large Department of Ed uh, five-year grant. Um, and then with Dr. Wormrill, we applied as well as with Dr. Shepard Jones and a whole host of strong faculty members. Um, we applied for the uh, HRSA Human Resources Services Administration, I think, Dr. Rumrell. Um, we it applied is. for a, a HRSA grant to to have our Kentucky LEND program, um, which is a large national program. There are LEND programs across the country. Um, that was a large and complicated proposal. And uh, then I would say this. Go ahead, Dr. Rumrell. No, that wasn't me. Go ahead. Okay. And then I would say on the small scale, um, we have grant opportunities here at the Human Development Institute called Funds for Excellence which are great opportunities for any staff member to get funding to do um, a project they're passionate about. And I've done a couple. Um, one was the self-advocacy um, workbook with a parent advocate. Um, I also did a preschool coaching uh, intervention um, project. And then recently, at right now, I'm doing a team building um, project with uh, doctors and professionals across the state to create programs for, uh, again, for persons who have substance use disorder and their children 
we're doing some team building to apply for a grant um, in about a year's time. So there you go. Thank you very much. Dr. Leslie, I know in the evaluation unit, you're involved with a number of uh, projects where we do the evaluation, but also we lead some projects as well. Can you tell us a little bit about your uh, recent experience with uh, grants and funding agencies? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think this is a conversation that, you know, we could have in depth and, and go on for a long time identifying different funding agencies. The one thing I will say is my background is is um, in disability service, is in rehabilitation counseling. Um, so my familiarity tends to be um, more specific to funding agencies and entities that tend to support disability service um, related uh, programs, um, things such as substance use disorders, mental health disorders, um, funding for service outreach, uh, comprehensive state, uh, needs assessments, those sorts of things. Um, so for example, a smaller regional grant that I've consistently been a part of for the last several years is through an entity called the ARC or the Appalachian Regional Commission, um, which funds different opportunities um, to look to research and, and expand service availability for individuals in obviously Appalachian regions of the country. Um, the, the program that I've worked on with them was a uh, needs assessment for uh, substance use disorder uh, availability of services and working with chambers of commerce and businesses to try to support kind of stay at work and return to work practices there. Um, so that's just one smaller um, entity that, that tends to do a lot of kind of regional um, grants um, uh, to, on top of some of the, the, the conversations we have around foundations, um, again, connected to disability. Um, most recently, uh, as I was transitioning to work here at UK, uh, around a year ago, I was working on a large project through NIDLR. Um, so NIDLR is a big funding agency that we typically work with in the disability world. That's the National Institute on Disability Independent Living and Rehabilitation Research, or N-I-D-I-L-R-R. -R. Uh, of course, as I mentioned, we call that NIDLR. Um, obviously, here at the University of Kentucky, we have some really big, um, incredible grants, such as the Retain Project. Um, we work on Retain through the Department of Labor. Um, most recently, we have just been working on a proposal um, through Dep the Department of Labor um, through ODEP, which is the Office of Disability and Employment Policy. Um, a lot of the grants that we, we work on include grants through SAMHSA, um, which is obviously Substance Abuse and Mental Health Service Administration. There is a federal government agency. We also have several that are in one way or the other through um, through the ACL or the Administration Administration for Community Living. Um, yeah, I, I think again, federal agencies. Uh, you know, occasionally we get some conversation around CDC grants um, and some interest around um, opportunities there. Uh, the Rehab Service Administration or RSA is another one um, that has a lot of disability and rehab uh, specific service um, grants that, that we've worked with uh, through uh, both in my, my previous work and in my current work now. Um, we, we work with RSA quite a bit too. So thanks, Phil. Thank you. Thank you. I should have, uh, uh, going after these folks doesn't leave too much in the way of uh, uh, uncovered uh, territory. Um, my own work tends to focus on the employment and education of people with disabilities. And I've been involved uh, with uh, uh, most of the uh, funding agencies that Drs. Gooden and Leslie have mentioned already. Um, uh, we had finished up a grant recently from the National Multiple Sclerosis Society, and we've done some uh, work with uh, a number of consumer or advocacy organizations and foundations uh, in the uh, disability Space. Uh, we currently have a project, an internal grant from the University of Kentucky, and it's called UK for KY. And this is a project we're doing with, with Laura Butler, who may be on the call, one of our HDI colleagues related to emergency preparedness uh, for people with, with disabilities. A very interesting uh, uh, project there. We've done some work uh, with the National Institutes of Health over the years, both uh, the uh, uh, general 
uh, Agency of uh, Institutes of Health and also the National Institute on uh, Mental Health, uh, Department of Defense, um, also the Office of Special Education Programs, the Office of Post-Secondary Education, all again within the Department of Education. So folks, this isn't just to give you a list of all the things that we've been involved with, but it does provide kind of a cross-section of the types of agencies and organizations that support uh, grants in our business of inclusion. And Caroline and Michael, uh, I often um, will often get questions, and I know you do too, from folks who say, you know, I've got an idea for a project. I just don't know how do I go about finding out where the funding opportunity might be. If you had to give just one, one piece of advice to someone looking to make sure that they understand when announcements come out, because you certainly can't write a proposal that you don't know about. So staying informed about what's coming and funding announcements and things like that seems to be a very important way to start. Would either of you share just one uh, bit of advice for folks who are wanting to get to know the funding opportunities in their area a little better? Dr. Leslie, you want to go first? Yeah, I can. Um, so for me personally, um, I, I I find that email lists, signing up for listservs and email lists tend to be the most beneficial way. So you just get all the announcements. Um, some weeks you're really busy and those announcements just kind of fall by the wayside and you don't get a chance to check them out. Um, but I, I I try to make it a habit at least monthly to just sit down and look through the opportunities from the organizations that I know align with the sorts of things that I am trying to, to participate and engage in. Um, it don't, doesn't always happen that way. I, and some, sometimes I'm, I'm kind of, I, I know that, you know, from a capacity standpoint, I have the opportunity to maybe do some more work. And so then I'm looking every week versus sometimes we're just at max load. And I'm like every month, I just try to like peruse and, and check it out. Um, I do think that this topic and, and forgive me, Dr. Rumro, if I'm, I'm sidebarring too much here, it, it's, it's really difficult to find kind of the nuance and the balance between taking something that you're really excited about and finding an opportunity to fund that work versus looking at what work needs done and finding how you have programs and, and ca capacity and strength to address an issue that, that is being identified by one of these organizations. Yeah. So I, I think it's a fine balance back and forth. Um, you know, it, sometimes it can feel like you're trying to fit a square peg in a round hole. And if that's the case, it might not be the right opportunity for you. Um, but I, I do think you just keep being patient and looking and, and eventually you find maybe the right fit there. Yeah, no, no doubt. And it's sort of like in, in career counseling, we talk about <clears throat> encouraging people to think about what their dream job is. You find out what, and that's true in the work that you're doing too. What's your passion project and then you go find funding for it. So the dream job is you figure out what you want to do. You get paid for doing something that you know you'd love to do. I want to be an online sports gambler in my next career. I'm just not very good at it. Um, but that's the dream job. And then you go find a way to get paid for it. The other way is you look at all the available jobs in your local labor market and you find the best one that fits for you. And you find ways to exercise your your goals and aspirations within the context of what's available. And so it really kind of works both ways. I'm really glad you mentioned that. And, and I, think, I think grant writing is, is, is part of both. Sometimes it's having those core ideas and then you go look for a place to get it funded. Sometimes it's seeing the application and it requires a little bit of creative thinking about how you plug your own particular interest, how you can put a spin on, uh, on that idea that will meet with the priorities of the funding agency. So I'm glad you mentioned that. And Dr. Gooden, I hadn't forgotten just, about you. Just just real quick, uh, Dr. Romrell, um, the uh, Michelle uh, Hoverson put a really incredible link uh, in the chat for anybody that is uh, a good resource for funding opportunities, including the federal, state, and foundation. That is um, ProQuest there. 
Uh, so check that out. Uh, and thank you, Michelle, who is uh, a, a um, invaluable resource for us in all of our grant work. So um, Michelle, we're glad you're here. Yeah, I second that notion. If you want to write a grant and get funded, get Michelle on your team. Um, the only thing I would add, Dr. Brummel, is to second what Dr. Leslie said. There's a grants office here at UK. And many yeah. years ago, I met with them and I we talked about what my interests are. And so the emails that I get from them are tailored to my my research interests, which is real helpful. That's great. And one, one, just one thing I, I would add, and I found this to be useful over the years, uh, uh, you, you is to get involved as a grant reviewer. And it, sometimes that seems like a lot of extra work. Sometimes you're like, how do I get involved in that? You'd be, you might be surprised to know that our large, particularly federal funding agencies often have difficulty finding enough reviewers for grant proposals in a particular competition. So in a co competition that is uh, consistent with your own background and experience, but not one in which you're competing, right? Because that would be a conflict of interest. You can register with any of these funding agencies, tell them you'd like to be a reviewer, and chances are they would take you up on it. It's a great opportunity, usually a two or three day process. It's all done virtually now. We used to be able to go to Washington, D.C. for uh, two or three days and stay in a, uh, a government rate uh, hotel for a, few, for a few days. And you get to read uh, any number of proposals, rate them out, grade them according to the criteria but you learn an awful lot. Not only do you make a connection with a major funding agency in your, in your area of interest, you also learn a lot about how grants are put together, you know, which ones work, which ones yield a high score. When you come back with the panel of other folks uh, on the review committee and, they, and you see the scores and you see what things played well with reviewers, what things didn't. So you can take on the perspective of the reviewer by being a reviewer. And that I think helps a lot um, when you write your own grant. I'd say the same in terms of getting on a editorial or, or review board for a journal. Uh, if you're reviewing other people's manuscripts, it's a great way uh, to learn how uh, to write uh, uh, articles for that journal and to um, uh, become familiar with what works and what ends up being published. Same is true in grants. Find out what elements lead to success, and you'll start recognizing what's a strong looking proposal, you know, and, and what things are most important, complying with the requirements exactly as they're written, not embellishing uh, too much or improvising, sticking to the headings that the funding agency requires, all these little tricks of the trade that many of you already know, but watching how other, um, uh, other applicants um, frame that in their own proposals and seeing it uh, is, is, is a really terrific way to do it. So I'd encourage everyone to consider signing up to be a, a peer reviewer for grants. And, you know, to, right. to piggyback off that, Phil, just really quickly, um, I, I can't tell you the number of times that we have heard about a uh, incoming funding opportunity because of networking and connections and involvement in things. And so, you know, uh, many of the funding opportunities we've pursued, I can say we learned about through word of mouth and through networking and connections and, and working with teams of folks that we've applied for different grants and programs with. So that's another maybe undervalued piece of this. Yeah, you can go searching for it and find it. But when you're connected and you're engaged in the field in, in ways that um, you, you can kind of find those opportunities through word of mouth and hear about them sometimes even ahead of time. Appreciate that. Yeah, that's a terrific point. Dr. Hermel, we have a comment in the chat. It's from Michelle. Another another comment from useful and very helpful comment from Michelle. Um, Michelle has linked a uh, put a link in there to the University of Kentucky's office uh, proposal development office. The proposal development office at the University of Kentucky helps and assists with identifying funding opportunities. A wonderful resource. Thank you, Michelle. Yes, Michelle, thank you very much. And if you happen to be affiliated with another university, your university has one of these offices at well, as well. It's great to get to know those folks wherever you may be. So appreciate all this very much. Uh, let's move on to the next slide here. This is gonna organize the uh, majority of our discussion today. And we've uh, uh, called this slide anatomy of a grant proposal. And what we've done is we've here we've listed out 
the sections of a grant proposal that are most often occur in any given application. So not all applications will have every one of these. They may call them different things. They may be in a particular order, but it's reasonable to expect if you're preparing a proposal that it may have these elements associated with them and, and parts that you need to cover. And what we've done is we've taken these uh, sections after we overview them and we, one of us uh, each will kind of answer first uh, some uh, strategies and tips and ideas that we have about completing each of these particular sections. And we'd be happy to, and, and so each panelist will have an opportunity to weigh in on each of these, but one person will sort of lead that discussion is how we've got it organized. And we'd welcome comments uh, uh, from the audience or questions as we go, uh, but in no particular order, although the abstract is usually first, um, most, uh, just click through these very quickly, most proposals will have an abstract. They're going to have a required uh, budget and budget narrative section. There's always a section on the need, the importance, the significance of the project, kind of the introduction to the whole thing. Then the project design, this is usually a major part of the proposal where you uh, explicate your plan for research, for services, for training, whatever those activities might be usually accompanied by the literature review that provides the supporting evidence for your program. The plan of operation and management plan, very, very important. You sketch out all the tasks that you will perform uh, in furtherance of the grant once it's funded. Then there's often a utilization or technical assistance or dissemination section. What are you gonna do with the findings? of your project or the results of them. Again, regardless of whether it's a training grant, a service-oriented grant, personnel prep, uh, uh, research or capacity building, regardless of the purpose, they wanna see that the results of the uh, project are being put, put to good use and how, do you, how will you go about that? The evaluation and quality assurance section, almost always part of every proposal you'll do. The section on project staff or personnel, um, another on the resources and the capacity of the organization to carry out the grant. Now, you may have proposals that have different sections. Sometimes there are, some of these don't appear, as I mentioned, but we think in general it provides a useful structure for breaking down uh, the proposal sort of from, uh, um, from, from A to Z. If we go to the first, next slide, excuse me, the first section being the abstract, uh, I'm going to kick this one off, but my, I'll have my colleagues share their own perspectives as well. And the abstract of a grant proposal is really like the preface uh, or the um, uh, prologue, you know, of a book. And so, it, you know, it's, it's going to summarize uh, all elements of the proposal, um, usually with an emphasis on the, uh, the par partners who are, who are involved in the grant whatever the goals might be, the objectives, perhaps the uh, intended outcomes usually be called for here. Um, uh, important to note here that the abstract is uh, often uh, unscored, meaning it's not part of those 100 points or whatever that you get for the proposal, but it is required. So you have to hit all those elements. So it doesn't uh, help you to have a great abstract, but it can hurt you not to have a good one, if that makes any sense whatsoever. So it is essential, even though it's usually not part of the of scoring rubric. Um, the funding announcement uh, very often has specific guidelines for the abstract, right down to the type of font you can use, whether it's single or double spaced. Uh, Michelle Hoverston can tell you that uh, we have to watch very carefully for the the number of words that are in an abstract, like we did a proposal not too long ago and it said you can have 620 words in an abstract. Sometimes it can have X number of characters. Sometimes it will tell you what needs to be in bulleted form and what needs to be a narrative. So you wanna pay very close attention to this because we find in, in, in the review process, you know, the, the, the preface of a book is what determines whether you wanna read the first chapter, right? And the abstract of a grant proposal determines whether you want to go on and how interested you are in the next section. Uh, and that's sort of how it flows from there. So if you can catch 
the reader's attention and get the reviewer thinking that you followed the format, that you've organized it well, that it's well written, it's clean. Um, that kind of carries forward. So even though it's not scored, it sort of carries forward the positive psychology that the reviewer has that your application is well organized, it's well written, you know what you're doing, you've got a good team in place. So the abstract is is that first impression, the first few minutes of the job interview, if you will, and it's very, very important. Um, you want to develop this abstract early on in the process. Uh, from my point of view, uh, the abstract then uh, really is helpful as the basis for uh, communication, as you're bringing on partners, as you're encouraging um, uh, folks to write letters of support and asking for other assistance, it just becomes kind of the currency. Your department chair or your supervisor is going to want to see the abstract to see what you have in mind. And so we usually start with this abstract really as the first thing we, we do before we start thinking budget, before we start thinking the operations at all. We sketch it out in a summary uh, fashion, and then we can communicate about it uh, with anybody who needs to um, who needs to understand it sort of as we go. It's also kind of an organic document, though. It's very likely that the abstract you submit as part of your proposal uh, will be different from the initial one that you draft, and that's okay. But every time you make a change to the body of the uh, proposal, you want to make sure you've made a commensurate change in the abstract. So very important way to uh, start, and it seems like kind of an uh, afterthought, but it's really, I think, much more important than that. Dr. Gooden, Dr. Leslie, anything to add on the, the art of the abstract? I like what you said, Dr. Rummel, about it, it becomes what we use to send to solicit partners for the grant. So it's really, it's something that I want to be exciting. I want people to want to join this group, this team. And so um, I really use it as a motivational tool to, to bring our partners on board. Yeah, you grab their attention. That's a great point. Yeah, I I would echo everything that's been said. Um, I think it's even worth kind of doubling down um, and and talking about um, reviewers are, you know, you mentioned people, we need reviewers, people are volunteering to do reviewers. Like at the end of the day, reviewers are just people. They're just like everyone else. Um, and they will do their best to be professional and set aside any biases and to read it as objectively as possible. But it's, in, it, it, it just is impossible to completely divorce yourself from a little bit of bias. And when you have a nice abstract, it just sets the tone for the rest of the proposal. Um, and it's, it really is sometimes the little things that matter. Um, and it really in, in Dr. Romero mentioned being organized and, and kind of, uh, having everything to a T as is expected. Um, and so I, I think the abstract is just setting the tone for the rest of the proposal. Uh, and so it is important to remember that. And and I like what uh, Dr. Romero said about using it as a foundation um, to then build kind of the rest of the proposal. And it's also in some ways very much a living document too, I would say, because as you go through the proposal, you might make some decisions to change some things. And then you go back and you kind of update and edit your abstract as you go. Uh, and at the very end, you're going to, once you have the entire body of the proposal, then you go back and you kind of finalize and make sure that the abstract is reflecting what ended up coming out across the entirety of the proposal too. Thank you, thank you both. We'll go to the next slide here, and this has to do with the budget. And uh, uh, this is of course important. We all understand how important the financial aspects of a project go. Um, we have our own uh, in-house uh, group of budget experts, uh, Sherry Power and her excellent team, uh, are available to help with uh, uh, all matters, budgetary and financial. Your supervisors are available as well. That's internal to UK, uh, to HDI. Um, but it strikes me, Dr. Gooden and Dr. Leslie, that many of us who go into these fields, um, whether we're trained in education or social work or counseling or psychology, um, we're not accountants. You know, We didn't go into it for the financial part of, of, of this may not understand how budgets really work and how things cost. We do understand our content and we've got an uh, interest in developing programs that affect uh, uh, people's, uh, people's lives and promote inclusion. 
but sometimes the budget stuff you really have to learn as you go, particularly if that's just not been your your background overall. So sometimes these get, you know, these sort of these get scary trying to put price tags on everything and how much time and effort does it cost and then putting dollar figures uh, onto that. It's always great to get help uh, from from folks who know this stuff better than we do, whose job it is. We've uh, and, and we've got great resources to do that uh, in HDI and across UK. But Dr. Leslie, I wonder if you might just take us through some of these bullets, some of the things you've thought about in preparing budgets, and what would you recommend to folks as they're crafting their budgets, regardless of the size of the budget? What are things that that uh, that, that that you've learned that you think would help people as they're putting together this extremely important part of the proposal? 